want to talk about the five bases of power. This is an important topic for every single leader, every single manager, director, supervisor, or even just an employee in an organization. They have a full understanding of this. This is an old study conducted by two people, French and Raven. It was actually published in 1959. So it's older, except for the fact the precepts upon which it's founded really apply to us today. Later on, French and Raven, they also added a sixth basis called information later on. But I wanna focus on the concepts of the five bases in the original study of coercive power, or in other words, ruling by fear, reward power, ruling with the opportunity to give people rewards for doing different things that they do, legitimate power, where they stand upon a position that they earn and they rule with that position, their referent power with their expertise when people come to them because of the fact that they like what they're saying, they have a following in their vision, or the expert power when people come to that person because of knowledge that they contain. Let's look at each one of these on, a, on an individual basis. And coercion, okay, to have coercive power, it's the threat of force to gain compliance from somebody else. It really is the idea of using fear to sit down there and get things out of people. Even though it sounds awful, it is by far one of the most powerful tools you will ever have in leadership to rule by fear. People actually are more motivated by fear and the raw ability of somebody to exercise power on them, whether it's physical, social, emotional, political, or economic, especially in the workplace, than trust or any other motivation. So fear is a huge tool, except for the fact that when you force somebody to do something, you do a couple things. You do your job or else bad things will happen to you. And sometimes it's never said that way, but it's implied that way. So the problem is you have two things. Number one, nobody likes to work in a workplace that's ruled by fear. You're going to end up losing some of your top talent and they'll leave your organization and you'll be left with the mediocre talent in the process as you come through. But it also depends upon the economics that are involved. You also have the aspect too of people won't be creative because they're fearful of stepping outside of the boundaries set by the leader who rules with fear. If I step out over here, I'll get dinged over here. If I step over here, I'll get dinged over here. Who wants to put up with that? So you have that aspect of it. So you lose your creativity, you lose your ability to innovate. The other part, which is kind of a strange process, except is the fact that the fear of the use of force is actually more powerful than the actual use of it. You have a group of 20 employees. Everybody's terrified to death to do something. And finally, because the ruler may sit down and say, yeah, I will fire you. And that threat of firing is terrifying, except one person finally does get fired. And then everybody sees the other 19, see the one person out there, they go out, they get a better paying job. And all of a sudden, the threat of being fired is not so powerful because they saw the person got by without it. So the idea of actually forcing somebody to do it is, and, and then using that power actually reduces the overall effect on the power. Reward power. Reward power is the aspect of giving somebody rewards. It could be tangible, social, emotional. It could be a spiritual reward, doing for something that they're wanted to do because they'll receive something later on for it. A lot of parents, they do this for grades or even sports. In our case, we did both. We had our youngest son. He wanted to be a soccer player at a young age, ripe old age of eight. He's going to play soccer, but not just any soccer. He's going to be a goalkeeper. Goalkeeper, really, they stand in the goal and they could be a hero and save the game, or they could be a dog when they lose the game because five goals got scored and you didn't score any. Oh my gosh, so either, either extreme. So we decided we start out, we gave them a dollar for every win and three dollars for a shutout. Yes, shutouts. Okay, but then he got older and he wanted to race. So Right. We went $5 for a shutout and $3 for a win. He got in high school, continued to play soccer, and all of a sudden he ended up with things, well, I want $10 for a shutout and $5 for a win. So we went along with that because it was even more exciting as the, the play got more intense. And then he got to college. He wanted $20 for a shutout and $10 for a win. And we said, no, stop there. Play it for the love of the game. 
The problem with reward power is exactly the same thing. As soon as you start giving a reward to somebody, as time progresses, as they become more successful in the process that they're going, they want more and more and more rewards. Also, you have the problem of other people hearing about those rewards say, well, what about me? I want a reward as well. So reward power has a limited effectiveness, and but it can be very motivating. And you'll see a lot of it in sales groups where they go through and they provide some type of incentive, a higher level of commission rate, a trip off to such and such a place. You'll also see year-end bonuses based upon this. You also have the third one is called legitimate power. It comes when somebody's elected or selected to a position of authority. And that could be underpinned by both social norms plus also the legitimate ability to use the other basis of power from coercion to reward or other ones when it comes down to that. So you have that as part of the role because people doesn't make that as having the legitimate power or sitting in the appropriate chair. Referent power is rooted in the affiliations that we have with organizations, groups, even the groups could be inside the workplace. We want to sit down and listen to that person because of the fact that we like what they say, we like their leadership style, we like the charisma they exude with it. It is a it's an area that really almost any agent of change they want us to sit down and reach for that to get people to buy into their vision and have a shared vision with them. It's likability, and people prefer this as the power base, and that way they have followers automatically without having to exercise the legitimate power that they have by position or rewards or coercion in the process. This is one of the most powerful of all the five bases of power. And then you also have the expert power where somebody is having people come to them because of their expertise. If you combine this with reference power into your portfolio of leadership skills, you will have a very powerful tool to use in the process. So that being said, you'll see expert power. If you have the expert power with legitimate power, all of a sudden now the level of credibility rises. And then if you have the personality that has a reference power following and you have the position and you have the ability to coerce, the ability to reward, you have all five bases of power, you have a fabulous blend that really can help you to become very successful in your leadership process. So expert power also is used by a lot of people in what we call the, the grapevine. When people sit down and they want to go to somebody who may not be their boss, but they have expertise in areas, says, hey, how do you go about doing this? And the person, even though they may be of lesser rank or the same rank as a person, has a certain sense of power because they can sit down and train other people in skills that they want. So that's another part of the expert power. Let me give you a, a brief thing over here in a YouTube moment, and I'm gonna to touch base on the aspect of a thing called Game of Thrones, where you step down and we go back, and we'll look at this in the process here. I should just take your food and leave you here. Okay? What would you do then? Starve, most likely. You don't think I'd do it, do you? What do you want, Bron? Gold? Women? Golden women? Stick with me and you'll have them all. For as long as I'm around and not a moment longer. If you want me to kill the mountain for you, it better be a damn big castle. Lannister always pays his debts. Your sister's a Lannister, too. My wife is heir to Winterfell. If I emerge from this with my head still on my shoulders, I may one day rule the North in her name. I could carve you out a big piece of it. I need you, Ned. Down at King's Landing, not up here, where you're no damn use to anybody. Lord Eddard Stark, I would name you the Hand of the King. I'm not worthy of the honor. Damn it, Ned, stand up. 
You helped me win the Iron Throne, now help me keep the damn thing. We were meant to rule together. If your sister had lived, we'd have been bound by blood. Well, it's not too late. When boys and girls live in the same home, awkward situations can arise. Sometimes I've heard even brothers and sisters develop certain affections. And when those affections become common knowledge, well, that is an awkward situation. Indeed, especially in a prominent family. Prominent families often forget a simple truth. I found. And which truth is that? Knowledge is power. Seize him. Cut his throat. Stop. Wait. I've changed my mind. Let him go. Step back three paces. Turn around. Close your eyes. Power is power. Do see if you can take some time away from your coins and your whores to locate the star girl for me. I would very much appreciate it. So, a great deal of literature is available about leadership, power, and strength. The best leaders have a good understanding of power, how they get to use it, the five bases of power, as well as how it's used on them as well. You, as a future leader, need to sit down and have this all in the back of your mind to understand when people are using power and when also you can use it as well. Take care.